Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, the speaker, I think everybody knows him, so I don't have to introduce him. Let's welcome the founding father of Free Software Foundation, Richard Stallman. probably last for a while before it comes off. So, let me get straight into the subject. What is free software? Free software, or CORNT, uh, <laughs> is, is software that respects the user's freedom. We call it free software because the user of the software is free. The software that's typically available to the public that's not free software is proprietary software, non-free software. It keeps the users divided and helpless. Divided because every user is forbidden to share with anybody else and helpless because the users don't have the source code so they can't tell what the so they can't change the software they can't make it do what they want they can't even tell what it really does but free software respects the user's freedom what does that mean we have to be more specific in order to make a meaningful statement a program is free software if the user has four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to help yourself. That's the freedom to study the source code and then change it to do what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom, the freedom to copy the program and distribute it to others. And freedom three is the freedom to help your community. That's the freedom to publish modified versions so others can get the benefit of your contribution. If you have all four of these freedoms, the program is free software. And that means it's being distributed in an ethical way. A way that respects your freedom. If you do not have all of these freedoms, if one of them is substantially missing, then it is not free software and you shouldn't use it and they shouldn't develop it. No matter how useful a program may be in a purely technical sense, if the social arrangements for using the program attack your freedom or attack your community, then that program is not a contribution to human progress quite the opposite. But why are these four freedoms essential? How do we reach the conclusion that free software should mean these particular four freedoms? Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to make and distribute copies, is essential on fundamental ethical grounds so that you can live an upright life as a member of a community. If you are using a program that doesn't give you freedom to, then you are in danger of finding yourself at any moment in a moral dilemma. Whenever a friend says, that's a nice program, could I have a copy? 
at that moment, you're going to have to choose between two evils. One evil is to make a copy for your friend and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. So when you are in this situation, if you are in this situation, you want to choose the lesser evil. The lesser evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. This evil is lesser because we can presume that your friend has is a good person and has treated you well. If the person who asks you for a favor has treated you badly, of course you can say no. So the difficult case is the case where this person has treated you well and deserves your cooperation. Whereas the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the bonds of social solidarity in your community. So if you have to do wrong to somebody, it should better be him than somebody else who hasn't done anything wrong. So the lesser evil is to make a copy for your friend and violate the license of the program. But being the lesser evil does not mean it is good. It's never good to make an agreement and then not keep it. It may be the lesser evil, but it's not good. And the only thing in software that's worse than an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program is an authorized copy of that proprietary program. Because then, usually, the developer is directly benefiting from his crimes against your community. So, once you have fully understood this ethical reasoning, what you really should do is stay out of the dilemma. Avoid getting into the dilemma. There are two ways to avoid getting into this moral dilemma. One way is, don't have any friends. <laughs> and the other way is, don't use proprietary software. If you don't use that program, you'll never be in a moral dilemma about whether to share it. Once I heard John Perry Barlow give a speech, and he asked the audience, if you have no unauthorized copies of software, raise your hand. And he was surprised to see a hand go up. And then he saw it was me. And he laughed and said, oh, of course you, Stallman. Because he knew all my copies of software are free software. And everybody can make authorized copies, including you and me. The most important resource of any society is not a physical resource. It is a psychosocial resource. It is the spirit of goodwill, the spirit of helping your neighbor. The level of this resource makes the difference between a livable community and a dog-eat-dog -dog jungle. So it's no coincidence that the world's major religions have actively promoted this spirit of goodwill or benevolence for thousands of years. Because if they can raise the level of this resource even a little bit, that makes life better for everyone. So what does it mean when powerful social institutions start saying that it's wrong to share with your neighbor? What are they doing? They are poisoning this essential resource, something that no society can afford. And what does it mean when they say that if you share with your neighbor, you're a pirate? What are they really saying? They are trying to equate helping your neighbor with attacking a ship. Now, real pirates don't use computers and software. They use ships and guns. And what they do 
is very, very wrong. But helping your neighbor is admirable. There's nothing in common between helping your neighbor and piracy. And that propaganda campaign does not deserve our support. And what does it mean when they impose harsh punishments on people who are caught sharing with their neighbors? How much fear is it going to take before your neighbors are too scared to help you anymore? Or before you're too scared to help them? Do you want to live in a society with that level of fear? What kind of secret police activity is it going to take to instill that level of fear, to punish all the people who help each other? I hope that you don't want that kind of fear to be established. And I hope you'll join me in saying that it's wrong. Now, that's the reason why freedom number two is essential. The freedom to help your neighbor. The freedom to make copies and distribute them. Something that every computer user can do. Freedom zero is necessary for a different reason. So that you can have control of your own computer. Believe it or not, there are proprietary programs that restrict even how the user can run them. They restrict how much the user can run them or how many different people can run them on the same computer or what purpose they can be used for. And obviously, if you can't even run the program as you wish, then you are not in control of your own computer. So freedom zero is essential, but it's not enough because freedom zero only means you can choose to do whatever the developer has already decided to implement. So you're still under the power of the developer. That's not having control of your own computer. To really have control, you need freedom one as well. The freedom to study the source code and then change it to do what you want. Now you are in control of what you do with this software, not some other. There's no one else who can impose his decisions on you. If you don't have freedom number one, the freedom to help yourself, you can't even tell what the program really does. Many non-free programs have malicious features. Features designed not to serve the user, but rather to spy on the user, annoy the user, restrict the user, or attack the user. Now, I think this is spyware. When I, if I use this to open the door of the place I'm staying, I think a computer records where I was. And that's evil. That's totalitarian surveillance. This is something we have to fight. For, for four days, I'll, I'll accept it. But if I were going to be here permanently, I would have said no. I've already said no to such things. It's a danger to our freedom to have the places we go keeping track of what we do. But lots of non-free software does exactly that. For instance, one proprietary program which has spy features that you may have heard of is called Windows XP. <laughs> when the user of Windows XP, I will not say you, because of course you wouldn't use a program like that, but when the user of Windows XP searches in her own files for some word or string, Windows sends a message to Microsoft saying what the string was. That's one spy feature, but not the only one. When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, it sends to Microsoft a list of all the software on the machine. Now, it sends this information encrypted, and as a result, it wasn't easy for people to tell 
that this information was being sent. It required a careful study to investigate. People had to be clever to figure out that Windows XP was spying on people in this way. But spyware is not limited to Windows. Windows Media Player is also spyware. Whatever the user looks at, it reports. Total surveillance. But please don't think that only Microsoft is so evil that it would do this. Because there are other proprietary software developers that also do it. For instance, RealPlayer spies on the user in the same way. And the TiVo spies on the user in the same way. It, total surveillance, reporting everything that the user looks at. When the TiVo was first developed, a lot of people in the free software community applauded foolishly. Because the TiVo uses a lot of free software. It has a small GNU plus Linux operating system inside it. And the people who thought that the goal was to use free software applauded. They thought, good, they're using free software. The problem is it also contains non-free software, which spies on you. So it's not enough to use some free software. The goal has to be escape from non-free software. Use no non-free software. Then you really have freedom. But malicious features do worse things than just spy. For instance, some programs change the machine's configuration so that it will display advertisements and annoy the user. The developers figure that the user won't know how to undo this change. And some of them actually put a requirement in the license that forbids the user to undo the change. But it gets worse than that. There's also the functionality of refusing to function, also known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, where the program says, uh, no, I won't show you, I don't want to show you this file. I don't want to let you copy some lines from this file. No, I'm not going to print this file for you, because you're not good enough. Defeat the functionality of refusing to function. Extremely nasty. But it can get even worse. Sometimes the non-free software has a back door. There was some non-free program that eventually was liberated. It was released as free software. And then when people could see the source code, they saw it had a back door and had had that back door probably for years. Of course, when the program was non-free, there was no way for the users to tell that it had a back door. When it became free software, they could see the back door and they could fix it. When it was proprietary software, they couldn't fix it. I don't remember the name of that program, but I do know of one program that you might have heard of that has a backdoor. It's called Windows XP. <laughs> you see, when Windows XP asks for an upgrade, Microsoft knows who the user is. I won't say you, because you wouldn't use a program like this. So Microsoft can give that user an upgrade designed specially for him, which means it might have additional spy features, additional remote control features. Uh, it might just refuse to work at all. And the user essentially has no recourse. So that's the back door we know about, because we can deduce it from known facts. But are there others? In India, they told me that several Indian programmers working on development of Windows XP had been arrested and accused of working for Al-Qaeda to introduce another back door. 
that Microsoft was not supposed to know about. Well, apparently that attempt failed. Was there another that succeeded? There's no way we can tell. I will not say that all developers of proprietary software implement malicious features, because they don't all do that. There are some developers of proprietary software that sincerely try to make a program that will do the job that the user wants. But they're all human, so they all make mistakes. They design features hoping the users will like them, but the users don't like them. Or they make errors writing the code. These are called bugs. And every non-trivial program has bugs. And the users are just as helpless in dealing with an accidental error as they are in dealing with intentional abuse. The user of a non-free program is a prisoner of his software. We, the developers of free software, are human too. So we also make mistakes. We design features that you don't like. We make errors in the code without knowing it. But there's a difference. You're not a prisoner of what we put in our code because you're free to change it all. So we do make mistakes, but you're not bound by our mistakes. However, freedom one is not enough. Freedom one is the freedom to help yourself. That's the freedom to personally study the source code and change it to do what you want. But this is not enough because there are millions of computer users that don't know how to program. They can't directly exercise freedom number one. But even for us programmers, freedom number one is not enough because there's just too much software. There's too much free software. It's impossible for one person to study it all and personally make all the changes that she might want. So the only way we can fully take control of our software is to do it by working together. And for that, we need freedom three, the freedom to help your community, the freedom to publish modified versions so others get the benefit of your contribution. This freedom enables us to make progress working together. Suppose most users want a certain program to change in a certain direction. Well, one of them will make a change and publish the modified version, and then most users will switch to it, and that will become the principal version. And then someone else will make another change going in that same direction and publish another modified version, and since it goes in the direction most people want, most users will switch to it. And then someone else will make another change going in that same direction, and so on. These many users together will make a series of changes that go in the direction they want. And together they will get a lot of progress of the kind that they want. <clears throat> so even though non-programmers cannot directly exercise freedom one and freedom three, they can choose whether to use the results and in this way, all the users participate in deciding which way the program is going to go. Free software develops democratically under the control of its users. Proprietary software develops autocratically. Now it's true, even autocrats face resistance from the public. Even autocrats can't get away with doing absolutely anything they want because it might have some bad consequences for them. But they do have a lot of power, and often they can impose their wishes on the public. Free software puts an end to that. Free software allows the users to decide which way the software should develop. But what if there are just a thousand people who want a certain change, and suppose none of them knows how to program? 
they can still get the benefit of the fact that the software is free, of the fact that users have these four essential freedoms. Here's what they can do. One of them can post an announcement saying, I wish this program had this feature. Does anyone else share my wishes? And the other thousand people will write back and say, I do. Then, once they're in contact, they can start an organization whose purpose is that they all join the organization and they all pay membership dues. And that way the organization has a lot of money and hires programmers to do the work. So if every member has to pay $100 US, then the organization will have $100,000 and that's enough to pay a few programmers to work for a year. So they could make a big change with that much money. Maybe they don't even, maybe they could do with less than $100 US from each member. How would they find out? Well, the organization, in order to do this work, has to pay programmers. So what it would do is it would talk to some programming company and say, how much would you charge to make these changes and when could you have it done? And then it can talk to another programming company and ask the same questions and then decide who to hire. Which illustrates that free software means there is a free market for all kinds of support and services. Proprietary software usually means a monopoly for support because only the developer has the source code, so only the developer can make any change. A user who wants a change ha has to beg, please, <laughs> please make this change for me. Sometimes the developer says, pay us and we'll listen when you report the problem. And if the user does that, the developer says, thank you. In six months there will be an upgrade. <laughs> Buy the upgrade and you'll see if we have fixed this problem and you'll see what new problems we have in store for you. <laughs> but free software means there's a free market for all kinds of support because anyone who gets a copy of the program can study the source code, master the program, and then begin offering support. Thus, for those users that strongly value good support and are ready to pay for it, they can generally expect to get better support for their money through the free market for support for free software. Usually we think that if there is a choice of products to do a particular job, there is no monopoly. And usually that's true, but proprietary software is an exception. Suppose there's a choice of three different proprietary programs to do a certain job. If the user makes the mistake of choosing this proprietary program, support will be this monopoly. If the user foolishly chooses this proprietary program, the support will be this monopoly. And if the user unfortunately chooses this proprietary program, support will be this monopoly. So it's a choice between monopolies. No matter which choice the user makes, if it's a proprietary program, it means afterward the user is dealing with a monopoly. And this illustrates an important general principle. Freedom is something much bigger than having a choice between a few fixed options. Freedom is not the same as mere freedom of choice. Freedom means having control of your own life. It doesn't mean that there are a couple of options and you're free to choose. That's just a tiny part of freedom. Having a choice between proprietary programs is being able to choose your master. Freedom means not having a master. So I've explained the four essential freedoms and the reasons for them, why they are essential. If a program respects the four freedoms, 
then it's free software. It's being distributed in an ethical way, a way that respects the freedom of your community. If one of these freedoms is substantially missing, then the program is not free software and you shouldn't use it and the developer shouldn't have developed it. That's the basic conclusion that I reached in the early 1980s, that it was wrong to develop non-free software and that using it meant giving up essential freedoms. And I decided I wanted to be able to use computers in freedom. But how could that be possible? The computer won't do anything without an operating system. And in 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. In fact, the user had to sign a non-disclosure agreement even to get the executable copies of the program. And the source code was not available to ordinary users. I had had an experience that taught me the ethical meaning of a non-disclosure agreement. You see, I wanted to add some features to the printer control software for the printer that we were using in our lab. All the other software, all the software in our operating system was free software, but the printer was controlled by software from Xerox that ran on another computer, and it was proprietary software. And so I couldn't add the features that we needed. And then I heard that there was someone who had a copy of that source code at another university. So I went there, and I went to his office and said, Hi, I'm from MIT. Could I have a copy of the printer software source code? And he said, No, I promised not to give you a copy. <laughs> and I was so stunned, I couldn't think of how to respond. I felt angry, but I couldn't think of a good way to express it that would do justice to the wrong that he had committed. He had betrayed us, his colleagues at MIT. He should have cooperated with us, but he had made a deal with someone else to refuse to cooperate with us. So he had betrayed us, but he didn't just betray us. He betrayed just about everybody in the world. So Cao Cao only spoke about betraying the whole world, but that guy actually did it. <laughs> and I, I thought about that because I had read The Romance of the Three Kingdoms in English translation a, a year or two before that. So when I thought about what this guy had done, I thought of Cao Cao. <laughs> And that's, that helped me understand the ethical meaning of this situation and of what he had done. And so I decided I wasn't going to do this. In fact, I have never signed a non-disclosure agreement for generally useful technical information such as software. I consider it unethical to do so. And I take this principle very seriously. So I wanted to be able to use a computer with entirely free software, but that wasn't an easy thing to do. There was no way to do it in 1983 because the operating systems were all proprietary and the computer is useless without an operating system. It won't run at all. How can I change that? Well, I could imagine convincing governments to change the laws so that software would be free. But I didn't think they would listen to me. I was just one man. I was not famous. Ah, there were a few Emacs users that admired my work, but that wasn't famous. And likewise, I didn't think that companies would listen to me if I asked them to change their policies. But there was one thing that I could do, and that was writing software. My field was developing operating system software. 
So I realized there was a way I could change this. Without convincing anybody in particular, I just had to write another operating system and say, this system is free software. I'm the author, and I authorize you to copy it and change it and share it. And then we can all use computers and be free by using free software. I realized that this was probably the most important thing I'd ever had a chance to try to do in my life. And I realized that if I didn't try to solve this problem, probably no one would. So I concluded I had been elected by circumstances to solve this problem. It was my duty. It's as if you see someone drowning and you know how to swim and no one else is around and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save that person. Well, I don't know how to swim, but I do know how to write software. And in this case, writing software was the job that had to be done. So I decided that I would develop a free software operating system or die trying, presumably of old age. Because at the time, the free software movement that I was just starting did not have enemies. There were people who disagreed with us, of course, but no one was actively trying to stop us from developing a free operating system. The obstacle was simply that writing a whole op operating system is a big job. And nobody knew if we would ever be able to finish this job. I didn't know. But I decided I would do my utmost. This decision led to other decisions, technical design decisions. What kind of system should it be? Well, I knew it would take years to write an entire operating system. And during that time, the architecture of computers could change. And back in the 80s, computer architecture was changing a lot more than it is now. So I realized that if I wasn't careful, I could develop a system that would be obsolete before it was finished. To avoid that, the system had to be portable. But I just knew of one successful portable operating system, and that was Unix. So I decided to follow the design of Unix. That way, there was a good chance that I could make a system that would work and would be portable. Further, I realized from my experience developing software for users that users don't like incompatible changes. If I had taken the best ideas I could see in all the various systems I had helped write or used and added my own pet ideas, I could have developed my dream operating system and it would have been incompatible with everything. And the users would have said, this is very nice, but it's, it would be too much work to switch. We've already trained our staff to use Unix. We've written software to run on Unix. It would be too much work to switch to your system, so no thanks. At that point, I would have had a perfect excuse. I could have said, I offered those people freedom. They didn't take it. It's their fault. But I wanted to make more than just an excuse to achieve no for achieving nothing. I wanted to build a community that would really have people living in it and living in freedom. To do that, I had to develop a system people would really use. Making the system compatible with Unix was clearly going to help. So I decided to make this system upward compatible with Unix. Upward compatible meaning that any time we had an idea for a nice feature, we could add it. But the Unix features had to keep working. Now, the design of Unix is that it consists of many separate components, hundreds of components back then. And they communicate through interfaces that were more or less documented. And the users used the same interfaces too. 
So to be compatible with Unix, you had to replace each component one by one, compatibly. Which meant that all the initial design decisions were made by this one basic decision to be upward compatible with Unix. And therefore, the only thing that I needed to keep working, to start working, was a name. Now, in the 1970s, I was part of a community of programmers who had the custom of sharing all the software that we wrote. And we were programming mainly for the joy of it. Most of us were paid also, but that was secondary. The real motive was the joy. And part of the enjoyment came from giving our programs funny names. And then we would imagine the users being amused by the names of our programs. And there was a specific tradition that when you were writing a program that was similar to some existing program, you could give your program a name that was a recursive acronym whose meaning was that this program is not the other one. It's a humorous way of giving credit to the program that inspired you. Thus, for instance, in 1975, I developed the first Emacs text editor, an extensible programmable text editor. You could change it while during your own editing session. And people liked this, so there were many imitations of Emacs. And some of them were called this or that Emacs. But one of them was called fine, for fine is not Emacs. And there was sign, for sign is not Emacs. And Ina, for Ina is not Emacs. And mince, for mince is not complete Emacs. And then Ina was mostly rewritten, and version 2 was called Zwei, for Zwei was Ina initially. So you can have a lot of fun with recursive acronyms. I looked for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix. But none of those possibilities is a word, at least not in English. So if it doesn't have another meaning, it's not funny. So I thought, what can I do? How can I find a funny recursive acronym for something's not Unix? Well, I could make a contraction. And that way I could have just three letters. Of course, the first letter could be anything, so I started trying all the possible letters. Anu, Gnu, Knu, Gnu, Inu, Gnu, Gnu. Well, Gnu is the funniest word in the English language, used for lots of wordplay. The reason is, according to the dictionary, it's pronounced Gnu. So what happened was, many, many years ago, some people started asking their friends, hey, what's Gnu? instead of, hey, what's new? And there was even a funny song inspired by the word GNU when I was a kid. So with so much laughter associated with this word, I couldn't resist. However, when it's the name of our operating system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you talk about the new operating system, you'll get people very confused especially since we've been working on it for over 21 years now. So it's not new anymore. But it still is and always will be GNU. No matter how many people mispronounce it and say Linux by mistake. So, during the 1980s, our work was to develop one piece after another of this operating system, aiming for the goal of having a complete functional free operating system. So all the various programs that I and other people wrote for the GNU project, the reason for writing these programs was the GNU system needed them. We were developing the GNU system. We were working towards the aim of being able to run a computer in freedom. And 
therefore we wrote this piece and we wrote this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece. Hundreds of different programs that we developed for this purpose. By 1990, the only essential piece that was still missing was the kernel. And we began developing a kernel, and as usual, I looked for a way to get it done sooner. So I found a so-called microkernel called Mach, which was developed as a funded research project, and that others were going to use. And so I said, let's use Mach as the bottom half of our kernel. And then we just have to develop a bunch of server programs that would run in user address space. And that way, they should be easy to debug because we can debug them with a symbolic debugger, a source level debugger. So I thought this way, it would be quick and easy to get a whole kernel running. I don't know why, but in fact it took about six years before we made the first test release of that kernel. I don't know why it took so long to get it to run, because I wasn't involved in working on it. I don't know what, what happened. Fortunately, though, we didn't have to wait, because in 1991, a college student in Finland developed his own kernel, using the traditional monolithic design. And he got it to barely work in less than one year. This kernel, which was called Linux, initially was not free software. Initially, its license had a restriction that prohibited commercial distribution. However, in 1992, he changed the license and he switched to the GNU General Public License, which is one of many different free software licenses. That's the one that I wrote for use in most GNU project software. So at that point, Linux became free software. And the combination of the GNU system with its many components and this one component, Linux, made a complete free operating system which was basically mostly the GNU system, but also contained Linux. The GNU slash Linux operating system, if you want to describe it clearly. The development of Linux, the kernel, was an important contribution to the free software community because that was the step that carried us across the finish line. Before that, we had the many pieces of the GNU system and there were people who would install a lot of these on top of other operating systems. But they always had to have some other operating system there because GNU was not complete. After Linux filled the last gap in GNU, the result was a complete operating system that you could install into a bare PC. And thus the goal that we had set out for almost a decade earlier had been reached. And for the first time, it was possible to use a PC in freedom. However, at the same time, a confusion got started. Somehow or other, people started thinking that this whole combined system, which was mostly the GNU system, but also contained Linux, they started thinking that the whole thing was Linux. And they started telling other people this, and all our efforts to explain to people that this is not true have not yet succeeded. Not completely, that is. Of course, we've informed a lot of people, just not the majority yet. So what we find is that a lot of people who use the GNU operating system together with Linux, the kernel, they think that they're using the Linux operating system, and they think that the whole thing was started by Linus Torvalds in 1991, and they think that it was all developed by a college student who wanted to learn and have fun. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to learn and have fun. I like those things too. I hope you like them also. But those motives did not give us the GNU operating system. They would not have been enough by themselves. The reason we have the GNU system is because of a many year campaign for freedom. In 1983, I made the initial announcement asking people to join in this campaign for freedom. In January 1984, I quit my job at MIT to begin developing the GNU system. And for many years, we were developing parts of the GNU system, even though people around us were saying the idea was silly, that we would never be able to develop a whole operating system. And I didn't know if we would ever finish an entire operating system. But we kept on doing it. And after taking so many steps, Linus Torvalds was able to take one further step and get across the finish line. This system was developed for the sake of your freedom. Most operating systems have been developed either for commercial motives or technical motives. The GNU operating system was developed so we could have freedom. And it's essential for the users to know this. Because, as history teaches us, freedom does not automatically continue. <coughs> freedom is always threatened. And the way to keep our freedom is always to be prepared to defend it. Whoever will not defend his freedom is likely to lose it. And that's just as true in this area of life as it is in all the other areas. There are so many people who will offer you attractive non-free software, essentially saying, pay your freedom to get this convenience. And if you don't value freedom, why would you say no? People who don't value their freedom will lose it because they let it slip through their fingers, because they don't bother to hold on to it. So if we want to win freedom and keep it, the most important thing we have to do is teach other people to value freedom as well. So they will make the effort to hold on to it, so they won't lose it without a struggle. And then we may keep our freedom. Freedom may endure. But the unfortunate effect of the confusion when people thought that the entire system is Linux is that it broke the connection from our software to our philosophy of freedom. Before that mistake, before Linux filled the last gap in the GNU system, there were people who used specific GNU components on top of other systems. And those people knew that they were installing pieces of the GNU system. And they appreciated them. They were GNU fans. They thought of themselves as GNU users. So when they saw the articles that we put in with some of these programs explaining the philosophy of the free software movement, basically the same philosophy I've been telling you today, they would pay attention. They would think, oh, this is the philosophy of GNU. Well, I like GNU software. I should pay attention to this. That didn't mean that everybody agreed with us. They made up their own minds, but at least they listened. So we had a chance to try to convince them. And we did convince some of them. And whenever a person was convinced and agreed with our philosophy, he would be motivated to develop more free software. So the software spread the philosophy, and the philosophy extended the software. But once people started using essentially the entire GNU system, plus Linux, and calling it erroneously Linux, they no longer were led to our philosophy that I've told you today. Instead, they were led to a different philosophy, the philosophy associated with the name Linux, which is the apolitical philosophy of Linus Torvalds. Those people think that the whole system comes from Linus Torvalds, so they listen to him and they don't listen to us. Now, as it happens, Torvalds never agreed with us. 
He doesn't believe that computer users deserve these freedoms. He thinks that proprietary software is ethically legitimate. Well, he's entitled to his views. The only thing I object to is when people attribute our work to him and think, and thus, when our work spreads his views instead of ours. So that's why I ask you to please call the system GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. Give us an equal share of the credit for the project we started. We deserve that much anyway. We did do the biggest share of the work. We deserve equal mention. But the, what's really important here is not just credit for anybody. That's just a matter of ego, and that's not really important. What's really important is to spread awareness of the philosophy of freedom. And you will do that every time you call the system GNU slash Linux. Because that way you will help the other users come to recognize that they're using the GNU system. And that way, later on, when they see articles where we talk about the philosophy of GNU, those users will think, oh, this has something to do with me. I'm using GNU slash Linux. I should read this. I should think about this. What happens now is they often say, that's the philosophy of GNU, but that has nothing to do with me. I'm a Linux user. Now, if only they knew that the system they call Linux is basically the GNU system, they still might disagree with us, but at least they would listen. And we need that. And sometimes it goes further. Sometimes they say, this philosophy looks, is so, it's so idealistic, it must be impractical. And there they are, fans of the operating system that was built by our philosophy. So clearly, it's practical. It's had practical results. If only they knew that the system they use is the GNU system, and it was motivated by this philosophy, well, they still might disagree with us, but at least they couldn't say it's impractical. And sometimes it gets even more ironic. Sometimes people say, this emphasis on freedom is a mistake because it interferes with the success of Linux. Look at the irony here. They're not just confused about what Linux is, they're confused about what success is. They think that the whole system is Linux, and they think that success means mere popularity. They have the idea that increasing the number of users of a certain body of software is the ultimate goal, and that anything that entices more people to use that body of software is good, even if it's a non-free program. They think that if a non-free program means more people use this body of software, that's good. And what is this body of software? It's basically the GNU system with Linux added. So these people are so obsessed with, the pop with making my work more popular that they fight against me while I'm trying to fight for freedom. Isn't this just delicious irony? I can realize that the popularity of my software is really not the most important thing. Freedom is more important. We only wrote this software so that we could have freedom. But those people, they're against our campaign for freedom because they want to make our software more popular. How can we set them straight? You can help set them straight. Just call the system GNU slash Linux and gradually it will sink into their minds that this system came from a campaign for freedom and that they should pay attention to the issue of freedom. Because the future of our community depends, above all, on what we value. In order for people to keep their freedom, they have to defend it. 
in order to defend their freedom, they have to value it. In order to value their freedom, they have to know what it is. In the 1990s, as the GNU slash Linux system started to catch on, we got millions of users and now tens of millions of users. But most of them have never heard about these ideas of freedom. They've heard that the system is powerful and reliable. They've heard that it's efficient. They've heard that you can use it cheaply. Various practical advantages. But they've never heard anyone talking about freedom as the goal. And they don't know what their freedoms are. So they're not going to fight to defend them. And they could lose those freedoms easily at any time. And they won't even pay attention. So how are we going to keep our freedom? <clears throat> if we could give everyone in the world freedom today, tomorrow they'd have freedom. Five years from now, would they still have freedom? Not necessarily. They might let it drop. If they don't make an effort to keep their freedom, they won't have it five years from now. So it's not enough just to give them freedom. We have to teach them what it is and teach them to value it. And then they will defend it. And that way, five years from now, they will still have freedom. <clears throat> we need to have a community of people who value freedom so that we can get organized and work to address the many problems and threats that we face. At the beginning, our work was just a matter of writing a lot of software. And now we've written a lot of software. At the beginning, nobody knew if we could ever develop that much free software. Today we've done it. We've done that much and a lot more. There's no doubt anymore that we can develop a lot of software that's good to use. The question now is whether we will be permitted to develop the software we need. Those are, that's the kind of thing that's holding us back now. For instance, nowadays, computers and peripherals are often sold without their specifications. The manufacturer will sell you this product, and they won't tell you how to use it. Instead, they will offer you a non-free program that runs the hardware. And they'll, they'll, they'll say, yes, we support Linux, but what do they mean when they say that? They mean that you could run the GNU slash Linux system if you install a non-free driver program. But that's not freedom. We need a free driver program. How are we going to get it? Well, there are two ways. Either they tell us the specs of the hardware so that we can write the driver program we need, or we figure it out by reverse engineering. But that's a lot of work. So how are we going to get their cooperation? We need an organized community of a lot of people who demand their freedom and who insist on their freedom and who are prepared to make an effort to gain and to keep their freedom. <clears throat> so in this computer that I normally use, you can see over here there is a modem. A modem that I can't use. It doesn't work because that modem is driven by non-free software. We don't have any free software to run that modem. Well, I got other modems. Because I'm, I'm not going to install the non-free software to run that modem. I won't do it. Actually, I don't know if it even exists for the GNU slash Linux system. Normally, it's used from Windows. It's a lose modem. <laughs> Now, also in this computer, there's a BIOS. Now, 
in the early 90s, when the GNU slash Linux system started to become popular, the BIOS was written in ROM. So it didn't raise an issue. You couldn't load in a new BIOS. The BIOS was just there, and you were stuck with it. But the result of that was it might have been just part of the circuitry. It didn't raise an issue of free software or not, because users didn't have files with BIOSes in them to load into their computers. But nowadays, the BIOS is stored in writable memory, and users do sometimes install new BIOSes. And as a result, the BIOS ought to be free. Well, people have written a free BIOS, but we can't install it in there. Because, first of all, the manufacturer won't tell us how to initialize the machine. And second, the manufacturer won't tell us how to load a BIOS. So the result is we're completely stuck. So now I'm trying to find a laptop manufacturer that will cooperate with us, that will support free BIOS. Now, that manufacturer doesn't have to write the free BIOS. There are people in our community who want to port the free BIOS. The manufacturer would just have to cooperate by giving us the specs of the hardware. And that's what we need. I want my next laptop to be a machine that supports free BIOS. But our community needs to speak with a loud voice and demand it. <clears throat> a year ago, less than a year ago, I thought that we had reached a terrible crisis with wireless cards. Because all the modern wireless cards require the user, or so I heard, required the user to get a file containing a non-free program and load it into the wireless card in order for the card to work. Well, we can't do that. Fortunately, I discovered that the RA Link chipset doesn't require this. So now we're recommending that people buy only RA Link chips for only wireless cards with RA Link chips because they're the only ones that don't need non-free software. So we just barely escaped from a very serious problem. Graphics chips, graphics accelerator chips have been a serious problem. And for many years, all of the alternatives were unusable. All of them required non-free software to run in 3D mode, and the manufacturers wouldn't tell us the specs. So they were stopping us, actively stopping us from writing our own free software. Well, people have been working without help from the manufacturer on a 3D driver for ATI chips, and it more or less works, but not perfectly. So they're, they're still trying to figure out what it is their software has to do in order to make the user's graphics appear on the screen properly. <coughs> I've heard that a couple of Taiwanese manufacturers released some information about their graphics chips a few weeks ago. I don't know the details, but I'm really eager to take a look because maybe they have improved the situation tremendously, or maybe not. You have to look at the details before you can tell what's really going on. I think I'll ask our sysadmins to take a look at this situation. So, at many different levels of hardware, we face this problem. We also face the same kind of problem with secret protocols and file formats. Several years ago, Microsoft Word used a documented format that anyone could implement, and then they changed to a new secret format. The reason they did this was they wanted to make sure that our software could not interoperate with theirs, so that then they could criticize free software and say it's not interoperable. You know, it's sort of like shooting somebody's legs and saying, look, he's a cripple, you don't want to work with him. <laughs> well, 
they didn't completely stop us because people figured out word format. And now Open Office can read most word files. But Microsoft is surely going to change the format again. And this time, maybe they will encrypt it every time. Or they might put in features that are patented and then threaten to sue us if we interoperate with them. Who knows what they're, what they're going to do, but we can be sure they're going to try to prevent interoperability. Because interoperability means the users have more control over what they do. Microsoft wants to lock people in. So this is another threat we face. And what we need to do to start protecting ourselves from this next attack before it happens is we have to start refusing to read Word files. When somebody sends you a Word file, don't try to read it. Instead, say, please don't send me Word files. It's a very bad thing to do. And on our website in www.gnu.org slash philosophy, you can find an article explaining why it's important to do this and giving reasons that you can present to those people who sent you Word files why they should not send you Word files. By changing social practice now, we can reduce the amount of power Microsoft has so that when they change the format again, the strength of their attack will be less and our ability to fight back will be greater. You'll find that there are some governments that talk to their own citizens using secret Microsoft-only formats. And this should be a scandal, that any government should talk to its citizens using a language controlled by a criminal corporation. Remember, Microsoft has been convicted three times. So bring up that scandal. Tell governments to stop using secret Microsoft-only formats to communicate with the citizens. Or even between government agencies. They should not be using these formats because they should not be giving some foreign company power over what they're doing. And just think of how dangerous that would be. To let some foreign company take control of the activities of the government to the point where the government is under their power. That's not sovereignty. That has to be rejected. <clears throat> and we have similar problems when people use non-free programming tools. For instance, Many programmers have been seduced by the Java language. They've been told that Java is platform independent. But that's not always true. You see, many Java programs will only run on Sun's Java platform. And Sun's Java platform is not free software. So if you run, if you write a Java program, you could make it free software. But if it needs Sun's Java platform to run, then people in the free world can't run it. Because we can't install Sun's Java platform. We would be giving up our freedom if we did. And we're not going to do that. And that means we can have your program, we can study it, we can change it, we just can't run it. Well, that's not a lot of good. If you want your program really to be platform independent, you can still write it in Java, but you have to take care. You have to make sure it runs on free Java platforms also. The best way to do that is to do your development on free Java, a free Java platform. See, all the features in the free Java platform also work in Sun's Java platform. We're trying to be compatible. So if, it, if you write it to run in our platform, it will run in Sun's platform too, no problems. 
But if you develop it on Sun's platform, you'll probably use features we don't have yet. And you won't even notice it because they'll work. And so when your whole job is done and somebody tries running the program on our platform and he says it doesn't work, you'll take a look and you'll see that your whole program is full of things that won't run on our platform. And you'll say, oh, I don't want to redo all that stuff to hell with it. But if you were using our platform all along, then every time you tried to use a feature we don't have, you'd see it immediately, and you'd just do that differently. And so it wouldn't be much extra work, and your program would really run in the free world. So that's what you've got to do. If you want to write a program in Java, stay out of the Java trap by developing it on a free Java platform. Now, of course we're trying to implement more of the features. If you like Java, then that's a great way to contribute to our community. Help us develop com more complete free support for Java. I say more complete because Sun keeps on adding features. So we're never going to finish the job. The job's never going to be finished because there's always going to be more. But at least we can get closer. And, of course, every additional feature that we have means additional Java programs can now run. So this is very important, and right now there's a big push. You see, one very important free software package called <coughs> OpenOffice fell into the Java trap. The new version of OpenOffice that they are now testing implements a lot of features in Java. And people reported a month or so ago that it only ran with Sun's Java. Well, this was a serious problem. But it turns out that the free Java platform is pretty close to having all those features work. So now people are putting on a final push to get all of them working. If you like Java, you could help in that. Just take a look at fsf.org and you will see there information about our high priority projects and follow that and you can help in doing this job. So these are obstacles that we face, but sometimes it's worse than just an obstacle because today we have something that we didn't have 20 years ago. We have enemies rich corporations and their puppet government in Washington are intentionally trying to stop us from serving the public. We want to develop software that you can use in freedom. They want to make it illegal. And in the U.S., it often is illegal. There are two different laws in the U.S that prohibit various kinds of free software. One of these laws is called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, an evil law because it prohibits software that you could use to bypass malicious features. For instance, specifically to bypass DRM. So if, if there's a program that has DRM and it won't let you do something and someone else writes a program that will let you do that thing. That program is illegal. And this law was used to prohibit the free software to watch the movie on a DVD. Now, this is, uh, this is, uh, What was I going to say? <laughs> uh, the format of movies on a DVD was originally secret. It was kept secret because the movie companies wanted to make all the, the electronics companies restrict the public. So the movie companies said, if you want to make a DVD player, we will make you sign a contract where you promise that your DVD players will restrict the user. 
in certain ways. So the whole thing is an evil scheme that should never have been allowed. But they did it. And then a few programmers in Europe figured out the format. So they wrote a free program that can decode the movie off a DVD. If you were in the United States, you have a lot less freedom now than you would have had a few years ago. But one of the rights that nominally you still have is that if you buy a DVD, you can watch it. However, the free software that you could use to watch that DVD on the free GNU slash Linux system is now illegal to distribute in the U.S. The U.S. practices censorship of software, and this program has been censored. In fact, there's no software legally available, whether ethical or not, that you can use to watch the movie on the GNU slash Linux system. So this one problem by itself might be enough to convince millions of users to use Windows instead. If they want to watch DVD movies in their computers and they don't know somebody to get a copy of DECSS from, they might choose Windows because it has the feature of watching DVDs. But this law only causes trouble in a fairly small area of software, programs that access encrypted media can be very important, but it's narrow compared with the whole spectrum of software. The other law that prohibits, that can prohibit software can attack any kind of software. That's patent law. In the US, any kind of computational technique can be patented. An algorithm can be patented, a feature can be patented, a, a data format can be patented. And the result is that if you write a large program which combines thousands of different computational ideas, probably hundreds of them are patented, which means any software developer in the U.S. is likely to be facing hundreds of lawsuits, potential lawsuits, because they may or may not actually attack you. But they could. We used to have to just speculate about how many different patents could all prohibit one program simultaneously. But today, it's not just speculation. A year ago, a lawyer did a careful study of one large program, namely Linux the kernel used in the GNU slash Linux operating system. And he found 283 different software patents in the US, each of which prohibits the use of some computational technique that is used somewhere inside of Linux. Now, Linux is just the kernel, and I read that Linux was approximately one quarter of 1% of the entire system. So by multiplying, we can estimate that there are around 100,000 software patents in the US prohibiting something that happens somewhere in the entire GNU slash Linux system. And this shows you why software patents are so such a bad system such a foolish idea, because they turn software development into a kind of gridlock. Developing large programs is combining thousands of ideas. If each idea can be patented, the result is simply to make software development dangerous and difficult. It's a self-defeating policy. It doesn't promote progress in software. It interferes with progress in software. And it also attacks the freedom of every computer user because it's not just the developers that can get sued. Every user can potentially be sued as well. Sued for performing certain computations on the computer. 
If there's a patent that says this patent monopolizes the following computation, any user running a program that has that computation in it can get sued. And in the U.S., there are hundreds of thousands of these software patents. So how we're going to cope with this, we don't know. We know that Microsoft wants to attack us with patents. We know that Microsoft is getting lots of patents, several more patents every week. We don't know why they haven't attacked us yet. I have a theory. I think that Microsoft is waiting for the European Union to make its decision about whether to allow software patents. They don't want to show how vicious and dangerous software patents are, because then the European Union might realize what a mistake it is, and then they might not let Microsoft have the same power there. So they want the European Union to make a final decision, and then they're going to show how stupid that decision was. So these are two different prohibitions that exist in the U.S. But you know, when there's a problem in the U.S., the U.S. government does not try to solve it. Instead, it tries to impose the problem on the rest of the world. So the U.S. government goes around the world trying to make other countries adopt the same harmful policies. And so we see some countries cave in and show that they're obedient parts of the empire, and some countries resist. It'll be up to you to strengthen the resistance here. Recently, Amnesty International reported that human rights and the rule of law are threatened increasingly all around the world and they pointed the blame at the government of the U.S. The government of the U.S. is attacking human rights and the rule of law around the world. It's up to us to defend them in the area of software and in all the other areas of life as well. But if you are in the computer field, then you have a special responsibility to defend freedom in your own area of work. That's what the free software movement is all about. In every area of life, there are essential freedoms that everyone should have. And in many areas of life, people have thought about these questions of freedom and have worked for freedom for centuries. But software and computing are fairly new. And even 10 years ago, most people in rich countries had never seen a computer. So, the, to, to begin to address the question of what are the essential freedoms for a person using computers is, a, is fairly new. But that's what the free software movement is all about. The free software movement has an answer to the question what are the essential freedoms of people in the area of computer use? And that's what our work is all about. How can society work to strengthen freedoms for computer users? Well, one thing that society should do is in government, Governments should make sure that whenever they pay to develop software, that software is free. And whenever they use software, whenever they install software on government computers, that software is free. And that way the government will throw the weight of its own spending onto the side of the freedom of its citizens. Schools have a part to play. Schools should use exclusively free software. Teaching people to use proprietary software is teaching them to accept giving power to 
a corporation that shouldn't have it. Teaching people to you in school to use proprietary software means turning them into addicts so that they graduate dependent on something that's going to cost them dearly. This dependency means somebody else has power over them. Schools have a mission to make society strong and capable and independent. And that means teaching the students to use free software. You know, when proprietary software companies offer to donate gratis copies of their non-free software to schools, they're not doing this out of goodwill. They're doing this to recruit the school's help in turning the students into addicts. If tobacco companies offered the school gratis packs of cigarettes to give to the students, the school would say no. The school would say, we would be betraying our own mission if we turned our students into addicts of tobacco. So the school would say, no, we won't hand out these packs of cigarettes. Take them away. The school should say the same thing when it's offered gratis copies of Windows. Because these students, after they graduate from school, they're not going to be offered gratis copies of Windows. They're, it's only the first dose that's free in the sense of zero price because none of them is free in the sense of freedom. But there are more important reasons for schools to teach the use of free software. One of them is for the sake of computer science education. You see, at the age of 15 or so, some people want to learn everything about how the computer works. So, if if they're using a program, they want to know how that program works. But when the student asks the teacher, how does this program work? If the program is proprietary, the teacher has to say, I don't know. And you're not allowed to know because it's a secret. But if the program is free software, the teacher can say, here's how much I know. And if you want to learn more, here's the source code. Read it. And if there's any point you don't understand, show it to me and ask me to help you figure it out. And this is how that kid is going to learn to become a good programmer. Some people are natural born programmers. They have a natural talent. But learning to write good code is not, writing good code is not automatic. That has to be learned. The way you learn to write good code is by reading a lot of code and writing a lot of code. Every time you read something and it's hard to understand, you learn that's the wrong way to write things. So free software makes it possible to learn this. Proprietary software does not. So schools that want to encourage people to learn to be great programmers should switch to free software. But that might seem like it's a small reason, because it only applies to the people who want to learn to program. What about everyone else? Well, schools are supposed to teach not just facts, not just skills, but also mo morals. Schools are supposed to teach people to be good members of society. They need to teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping other people. So the school should have a rule. Children, if you bring software to class, you can't keep it for yourself. You have to share it with the other kids. And if, you're don't, if you don't want to share it, you can't bring it. But the school has to follow its own rule. It has to set a good example. So the school must only bring free software to class. Now, I'm going to finish by presenting you my alter ego. <coughs> so
sometimes people accuse me of having a holier than thou attitude. I think they're mistaken. And I'm not looking for excuses to criticize people just because they're not as strong supporters of free software as I am. I want to encourage everyone to support free software as much as they can. However, I do have a holy attitude because I'm a saint. It's my job to be holy. <laughs> I am Saint Ignatius. <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as a text editor, which became a way of life for many users because they could do all their work without ever exiting from Emacs. And then it became a religion. Now we even have a great schism between two rival versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we worship an editor. To be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with some other churches that I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. So if you're looking for a church to be holy in, you might consider ours. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise any proprietary operating systems that possess any of the computers under your control, and then install a wholly free operating system, where holy can be spelled in more than one way, and then only install free software on top of that. If you make this vow and live by it, then you too will be a saint, and you may eventually have a halo, if you can find one, because they don't make them anymore. Sometimes people ask me whether it is a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the editor VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free version of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me if my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. So, thank you. Before I take questions, I should mention a couple of ways that you can help the Free Software Foundation. One thing you can do is become a member. If you look at fsf.org, you can join the Free Software Foundation, which is a way of supporting our work. Another thing you can do is volunteer and work on a free software project. If you take a look at gnu.org, you can find various ideas. There are many free software projects hosted on savannah.gnu.org. And there are also suggestions for tasks to be done. You could also take these stickers. This is a very easy thing to do. Take some stickers and put them in permanent places where people will see them. And that will help make people aware of our work. You could also buy these pins, which are sort of elegant. I'm selling them for $300 NT. <laughs> and uh, and that money will go to the Free Software Foundation and help our work. Of course, you may be in a position to help in other ways. If you can convince a school where you work or study to move to free software, 
That will be very important. If you work in a company and you can convince the company to cooperate with free software, that could be extremely important. So there are many different ways to help the cause of free software. Programming is one of them. And now I guess it's time for the questions. No questions. <laughs> I couldn't believe I had addressed every issue clearly. I was going to follow the Dakun from the people from the library or some. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh. In fact, I think the microphone may not be working. Is it switched on? <laughs> I'm a bit hard of hearing, so you need to speak loud. Is it okay now? Speak louder, please. Okay. Louder. Shout. <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay, I'm asking about that uh, GNU can offer us a uh, portable, uh, uh, portable library that we can, on top of it, uh, uh, make a free software. How about some people who can use this to, to create a portable software? I mean, like Linux. Suppose someone who, like, who can take GNU and take advantage from GNU and sell the software and later and become a prototype. Okay, let me, you've asked several different questions thinking that they're the same, but they're different. First of all, anybody can sell free software. One of, you know, freedom too is the freedom to make copies and distribute them. And that includes the freedom to sell copies. So selling software, literally speaking, means I hand you a copy of a program and you give me money. There's nothing wrong with that, and in fact, you're free to do that with free software. So we're not trying to stop people from selling software. We're trying to stop people from, a, from taking away other people's freedom. Now, some, mo most pieces of the GNU, most GNU components, that is, most of the software we developed specifically for the GNU system, and in fact, most free software is released under the GNU GPL. That's a particular free software license that says modified versions must also be free software in the same way. So in fact, if a person tried to take a piece of GPL-covered software and make a modified non-free version of that, we could and we would sue him, and we'd make him stop. In fact, we probably wouldn't have to sue him because we would just tell him we would sue him and then he'd stop. We're doing that all the time. We actually have a staff person in the Free Software Foundation whose job is making them stop, making them start distributing the source code that they're required to distribute. However, it is possible, legally, to develop non-free programs that run on top of the GNU slash Linux system. This is because GNU libc, which is the program that every user space program has to link with, practically speaking, is released under a different license which is more permissive. Now that was a strategic decision we made. We could have released GNU libc under the ordinary GPL, and that way, we would have said, only free programs can run on top of the GNU system. But when we thought about that, it looked like the main effect of that would be that the GNU system would not catch on. In other words, sometimes if you push hard against somebody else who's doing something bad, you can push him back. But sometimes you only push yourself back, and that's not particularly good. So it's a, it's a strategic decision, and I hope that our decision was the right one. This <laughs> about virtual machine, about GNU and virtual machine. I don't know if there is any free software support for virtual machines, but there might be. I can't remember. 
if you look in the free software directory, you can see if we have such a, a facility. Uh, the free software directory is in www.gnu.org slash directory. Any other question? May I have a question, my lord? I have trouble hearing you. <laughs> so, excuse me. Uh, about a few, few weeks ago, a smart hacker tried to hack the BitKeeper source control system. Ah, uh, well, yeah. that's, that's actually a mis misunderstanding. BitKeeper is a non-free program. Yeah. And, and yeah. for a few years, BitKeeper was used in the development of Linux. This was a very bad thing. Uh, Linus Torvalds has never believed in free software. And he was using this non-free program publicly in the development of Linux. And that was sending a very bad message to our community. He was leading people in the wrong direction. And I criticized that very strongly. I, I said that it was wrong to do this. And I urged people to refuse to do it. Torvalds didn't listen to me, but I hope others at least were discouraged from following his example. Well, a couple of months ago, someone else wrote a, an alternate client to talk to the BitKeeper server, which was free software. In other words, he, w and he did this because he wanted people to be able to work on Linux development without using the non-free BitKeeper program. So he's a free software activist. He agreed that BitKeeper was a bad thing and he wanted to do something about the problem. And he used the same method that I used. And the result of this was that the developer of BitKeeper got so angry that he demanded that this, that this person stop. And he wouldn't stop. So then the developer of BitKeeper said, well, I refused, I take back permission to use this for Linux development. Which, as far as I'm concerned, means the problem is solved. Because, you see, BitKeeper is not a big threat unless it's being used for Linux development. Because using it for Linux development means that Linux development is saying a bad message to the public. When Linux development uses BitKeeper, it's teaching the public that non-free software is okay. So he takes BitKeeper away from Linux development, the problem is solved. Yeah, as I know, Torvalds already changed to JIT. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he finally did. He <laughs> should have done that three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> He should have done the right thing three years ago rather than waiting till somebody else forced him to. Well, some rumors had uh, this action already ruined and destroyed the free community culture. That's exact my question. Uh, would you please? Well, it didn't, I think it, it would be an exaggeration to say that it destroyed our community, but it shows a weakness. The weakness is that there are people like Linus Torvalds who don't recognize the importance of freedom. Well, you know, there are good things about him and bad things. The good thing is he developed an important free program. That program, Linux, is quite useful. The bad thing is that he's that to the extent that he is in a position of leadership. He is leading people to devalue freedom. Thank you very much. I, I cannot agree with you anymore. <laughs> well, you're entitled to your own views. But, you know, if you, if you think that freedom is not important, you're going to lose your freedom. I just hope we manage to hold on to our freedom when you lose yours. Um, 
I have a question about the technology. Uh, you just mentioned a thing about, let's say, uh, You need to speak louder and clearer so I can hear you. Okay. Um, I have a question about the website. It, I, I'm not sure if I heard it correctly. That you mentioned that you can uh, make commercial products out of the new uh, systems. Actually, that's a misunderstanding. I didn't say commercial products. Remember, free programs can are commercial products very often. Perhaps when you're saying so, when you say commercial, that's a confusion. Perhaps what you mean is proprietary. You said that you can make. Um, of so software, you can sell them. Well, all free software can be sold. That's part of the freedom. Okay. The freedom to sell copies. All free. Anyone can take any free program or the whole GNU plus Linux operating system and make copies and sell them. Is it possible then that after somebody purchased uh, software and make free distribution out of it? Yes. Wouldn't that kill the motivation of selling? I don't know. I don't care. I mean, you have a right to sell it. But, I, but you know, whether you want to or not, that's your problem. Because I think that's a very serious problem, because that's one of the main... It's not a problem at all. <laughs> that is, it's not a problem for our community. Our community is doing very well. Aside from those places where our enemies are trying to stop us from developing free software, we're developing lots and lots of free software. So things are going just great. We don't have a problem of that kind. So there can, this can't be a problem because we're too healthy. We can't, it's, it proves we don't have a problem there. So on the other hand, somebody whose goal was only to make money, and he has no scruples. So he doesn't mind making money by taking away other people's freedom, by trying to seduce other people into giving up their freedom. He might think it's a problem. But I just call him a predator, and I hope that he fails. <laughs> Those people should not be able to attack our society. I don't care particularly whether someone else can make money in a particular way. It's not important. You know, if you can't make money this way, do something else. Get a job. I mean, there's so many different jobs that people have in society. Society is very complex now. There's so many different things people do. So if a person says, I want to be able to make money by selling non-free software, my reaction is, you shouldn't be able to do that. That's evil. If I can stop that person, I'm glad. Because that person wants to prey on us. If, he, if, if you become his customer, that means you have promised not to share with me. So you've done something wrong to me. Well, I don't want that to happen. I don't want my neighbors to be customers for that predator because that means they're betraying... If they're betraying the whole world, in particular, they're betraying me and they're betraying you. That shouldn't happen. So these people who are saying the world should revolve around my ability to get rich, I don't, I don't care what they want. The world shouldn't pay attention to what they want. We should defend our freedom. So we should say to these people, if you find a way to make money respecting our freedom, treating us decently, more power to you. By all means, make money. But if your idea for how to make money involves dividing us from each other and keeping us helpless, <coughs> imposing your power over us, that's wrong, and we're not going to let you do that. That's the way we maintain a free society. So, when people say, I think it's a problem that we can't make money with commercial products in free software, the answer is, why do you call that a problem? If, you're, if, if, if your goal was to make money through a commercial product that's not free, 
it would be a problem if you succeeded. If you fail, that means the problem didn't happen. So the, the idea of the free software movement is not to give up our freedom for the sake of an attractive program. Now, you could also take and try to make the argument that free software can't succeed, that we can't develop enough free software because we're not giving people a way to make a lot of money from it. And that's like arguing that airplanes couldn't fly. Well, just look up and you see they're flying. Just look around and you'll see that we are developing lots of free software. Whatever difficulties there are, they obviously are not enough. They're not enough to stop us. So you might ask, why? Instead of arguing that we can't develop enough software, you might ask, how is it we develop so much software? Instead of arguing people won't write free software, you could ask, why do people write free software? There are about a million or so contributors. What are their motives? I've seen many different motives. Some of them are getting paid. In fact, it is possible to make money developing free software. There are programmers who have been hired to work on free software. And there, you know, some work for big companies, some are being funded by governments. After all, a large fraction of software development has always been funded by governments. Why shouldn't it be free software? It's no harder for the government to fund free software than to fund proprietary software. And then there are people who work for small companies. There are free software support companies where the people's jobs are extending various free software to do the things that clients want. In November, no, sorry, it was in October, I was in France, and they told me that free software companies in France now employ 1,400 people. So this is not tiny. It's substantial. It's not gigantic either, but you know, as more people use free software, the market for this is going to increase. So it is possible to make money, and it's possible to have businesses based on free software. But we shouldn't judge everything by commerce. Not when something more important is at stake, such as our freedom and our community. And um, I have one more question. Um, I actually just switched from Windows to Apple, unfortunately. So it's one proprietary system to another. <laughs> and, uh, I realized that when I was using uh, Microsoft because Internet Explorer before, uh, I could see view lots of um, contents with no problems at all, but now um, my Firefox or Safari, I see that some of the websites are particularly um, designed for my Internet Explorer, so I can see the... So content. write to them and complain. I'm serious. This is very important. If those sites get a lot of complaints, they'll change. It's a matter, basically, they are pushing in one way, and the question is, how hard do we push back? If we are content to give up, if most people just let them push, you know, the, uh, let me say this more clearly. They are trying to push you to use Internet Explorer. So if you let them push you, th then they get what they want and they see no problems. So they'll never change. But if you, meaning lots of people, push them back, then they will see that they are losing something through their policies and they'll change. So if we push hard enough, eventually they'll give in and we won't have to push them anymore. We'll win. Thank you. Uh, is that loud enough? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have thoughts 
developed your own kernel instead of Linux? Well, we, as I said, we started developing a kernel in 1990, and it just doesn't work that w it doesn't work well enough to recommend it. So the question is how to work more on it. Well, what it needs is at this point it needs somebody who wants to take charge of it and integrate other people's contributions. There are various people who would like to contribute. What we don't have is the person to say, I'm going to make this system work reliably. I will I will organize to give other people a way to contribute. That's what it needs if it's going to make any more progress. So currently you cannot... You well, you can run it, it's, but it's, there are various limitations and, and problems. So uh, we don't recommend using it unless you want to work on developing it. Uh, potentially it could be more powerful because of its more powerful architecture. But in order to in order to be good enough that we would recommend using it rather than Linux, it has to be more reliable. And we have to, you know, one of its limitations is it can't handle a disk partition bigger than 2 gig. Somebody a couple of years ago wrote the code to, to handle that. And as far as I heard a few months ago, it had not yet been integrated. Now, what can you do? We need someone who's going to integrate these important improvements, not just work on his own pet project. So, but one of the reasons we don't have it is that this is not the most urgent thing for us to do. After all, Linux is free software, and Linux works very reliably. So we don't urgently need another kernel. If this were among the highest priority needs of our community, we would have found somebody. But the fact is, it's more urgent, for instance, to implement, the, to extend the free Java platform. Because there, it's a matter of making free software do something that right now it doesn't do. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you could give a really good speech. I'm sorry, what? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> I think your speech is really good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one question. Um, I think my personal impression that uh, free software uh, feels a little support about the uh, documentation. So the explain of... The That's software. true. It's one of the places that we have have been backward is in good documentation. Uh, so if you are good at writing documentation, please <laughs> go that way. So um, another thing is that free software is a lot of a piece of element, and how do you integrate all these elements into a, like a bigger? Um, I don't understand system. what you mean by integrate. Integrate into what? Okay, free software. A lot of programmers just um, why they write free software. That because they, maybe the, during their work they need to solve the problem, so they write this tool and they freely distribute these tools, and they become free software, right? So if you don't, if you think it should be better integrated, modify it so that it's better integrated. You know, don't speak to us and say that we should do more for you. You should do more. <laughs> I should also point out that you are making a general statement which is only sometimes true. There are many examples of large collections of free software that are very well integrated. For example? Well, uh, you know, the various GNU slash Linux distributions and things like that. GNOME and KDE, which are graphical desktop environments, which are both quite integrated and are based on coherent graphical standards. Uh, so you, there, are, there are both kinds of cases. So it's not correct to say that you, know, you have a criticism which is valid in some cases, but not always. And if a particular well, program... What? The programmer or... Um, Whoever writes it. 
If you want to write better documentation, you'd be welcome to. <laughs> where, where do I distribute it? Oh, what you would, if you want to write better documentation for a free program, probably what you should do is write to the developer of the program and say, I have better documentation for you. How about if you put that in the distribution with your program? That's the best place for it to be. Then anyone who gets the program will get the manual. That's where the manual ought to be. And thank you for the documentation you're going to write. <laughs> what do you think is the best solution or suggestion to do with the um, Microsoft do the play by uh, software backend? We'll have to see because those answers always depend on the details. But, you know, it, it could be devastating, or maybe not. What I hope is that some countries will have the good sense not to allow software patents, because it's a completely stupid policy to allow software patents. So free software will survive at least in the countries that don't allow software patents. And the question is, to what extent we'll be able to keep it going in other countries, too? Maybe some companies will use their patents to defend us some of the time. But we can't count on them to do that all the time. So, against a company like Microsoft, which makes products, other companies could defend us with their own patents. They could threaten to sue Microsoft. But they can't defend us against patent parasite companies that don't make anything except threats. You know, a patent parasite company is a company that has a patent and it goes around threatening people with its patent and saying, pay us money, pay us money, we'll attack you, we'll attack you. That's all they do. They don't produce anything. And they never developed anything. They probably bought that patent when some startup company went broke. And now their business is parasitism. Those, in some ways, are the most dangerous because nobody can make them cross-license. So even if some big company with patents wants to defend us, they can't defend us from parasites. Nobody can defend it, can defend himself from parasites. And there's somebody back there who should be ne the next one. Okay, I have a question about the, more the philosophy of GNU. Is there been any effort of doing the same type of effort uh, with things that are not software related? Yes, there is the free encyclopedia, Wikipedia. I see. Well, that was inspired by the free software movement. It's, it's instead of free software, it's a free encyclopedia. And we need, now we need free textbooks <laughs> and free dictionaries. Wikipedia is starting free dictionaries. You could contribute to that. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, a free Chinese dictionary and a free Chinese English dictionary and a free English Chinese dictionary? You could all work on that. Uh, I'm curious about how to use style your, style your program life. I'm sorry, how do you use program, what? Writing program like. I don't understand. I, mm. I don't you, know what those what that you means. Develop your, your system, you write, write your code. And how do you start, start to write your code? I don't understand what he's asking. Maybe if he asks you in Chinese, you can tell me. Your first program. Sorry, what? Oh, 
So what did he say? Oh, what was my first program? Oh, well, when I was about 10, I, I went to summer camp, and one of the counselors had a manual. So I read the manual, and I said, I want to write a program. What should I write a program to do? And he said, well, write a program to... Uh, take a table of numbers and make the cubes of them and add them up. And I said, okay, because I, I, there was no computer there. That was in 1963 or so, or maybe 1962 when I was nine. I, mean, I don't remember, but the point is, there was no computer and there was nothing I really wanted to do with a computer. I was just fascinated by programming. I had a manual for, I think it was 7094 assembler language. So I wrote this assembler language program, which of course I never had a chance to try to run, nor would I would there have been any point. Then in 1969, for the first time I got to see a real computer, that's when I was 16. And I started writing a program that was a preprocessor for PL1 that added the summation convention. So, I never finished that, but uh, <laughs> I first started writing it in PL1. And then I discovered that the code I had written was so big it couldn't fit in the computer. So then I started rewriting it in assembler language. And I debugged a few passes, and then I found other interests. So then, uh, in the summer of 1970, I wrote a text editor in APL, which couldn't actually run because APL didn't have suitable I.O. facilities that you could write any text editor in it. But it, so you, it couldn't be useful, but at least I'd had the fun of writing a text editor. So let's thank Richard Stallman, the Stallman, the other Stallman. Yes. Richard, you here, and you want to, you know, have a photo with him, go ahead. Yeah, don't <laughs> ask, just do it. Yeah, don't, don't ask, just do it. <laughs> Those questions really annoy me, they waste a lot of time. So, so don't ask. And if you want stickers, take the quantity of stickers that you can use.